Well, we fought many years for equal wages with male conductors. We eventually won it. After that? Simply because we were women. We weren't entitled to the same wages as men, although you were doing exactly the same job. I mean, in bus conducting, there was no argument that you were doing the same job. It was exactly the same job. Sometimes in a factory, you could say, well, we're not doing the same job. But everybody could see we were doing exactly the same job. Well, we had to involve women in every depot in Scotland, including the Glasgow Corporation. But they got equal wages before we did. But we had to go round all the depots and contact depots away up north and down south and everywhere to ensure that we had plenty of support. But we eventually won it. Certain conductors were picked to take trainees, you know, and I used to take quite a few of them. And it was the first thing I always said to them, you must join the union. And if they didn't understand what the union was about, well, you explained it to them. You took them to the first union meeting. There was a meeting every month. And said to the branch secretary, that a new member here, you know, that them signed up. That then, women were more inclined to fight for their rights than they are now. Yeah. I find, I've spoken to a lot of women, and they're frightened to open their mouths. Well, they're frightened maybe they get the sack. Yeah. Some jobs now, women must have a hell of a hard time, because there's such a lot of places of non-union now. And if they're non-union, the company can do whatever they like. I think we need to educate women a lot more. Particularly the young women. Someone I know has got a plasma television, two cars, the family, all the family smoke, they drink and they have a good time and they're all unemployed. Is that poverty? Eh? Poverty dealing with. <laughs> I meant to mention that. Have they ever worked? Have they worked? Ever worked? Never worked. So therefore, that's a, that's a, a type of problem we've got. The, the film says building a community. I feel like the community I, I'm in is now being destroyed. There's nothing I can do to fight against it. So there's all, there's all, there's all time it takes of property. You probably notice I'll be a tie most of the times, right? No bad. Jack the lad. The reason I dress myself up and be a tie most of the times is quite simple. When I was unemployed in my twenties, I, I was married, unemployed, with a child, and a society man came in to see me, pay my insurance. He says to me, "Are you working today? Are you working in here?" I says, "No." He says, "What are you working?" He says, "You're a part. You're working gear on. No, I'm doing, doing a bit, doing that." He says, "Don't be like that." He says, "You're unemployed. Don't always dress yourself up. Don't let yourself do it. Take your child, child out and take your wife out and do what you can. I walk in the park. Don't just sit in the house being depressed." No, I was depressed. And the telltale sign of how he knew I was depressed was I didn't have a watch on. I didn't, I didn't hear about this. And that's what happens when you come on board and depressed. Time, time is nothing. Where were you all here? Unemployed and depressed? Oh, aye, but I'm a hobbyist. I've got plenty to use up my time. Very seldom in the house. But my the day of watching the telly starts at five o'clock at night. I don't turn it on during the day. Because I've got plenty of day outside to, to use up my time. I think I'm going to have a I tell Jack. I think I'm going to have it. Grandfathers have not worked, and they're for their sons, who are their husbands now have not worked, and their grandsons have not worked. So you've got a family with a grandfather, a father, and a son who have never known what it is to work. You always, you always think that people burst off for yeah. yourself, that's what you looked at. Yeah. People burst off for yourself, that was, that was just the different levels of, of life. You know, there's always, I mean, I have to always say for some of my neighbours, get a review of seven years in the one house. And the, there's neighbours just too close to doing. They couldn't even do it. 
but the dish was just full of leaves. You don't even need decor, nothing. Well, yeah. Said. Well, you've got the standard the house building new up Goldsby Street. It's rubbish. A skin of brick and a wooden frame. The wooden frame holds the roof up. And when, when we had the meeting in Orkney Street with a lassie that represented the house builders, they were talking away, and at the end of all, I told her the house is a building is rubbish. She said, Oh, well, you kind of staggered, and then she said, Oh, I thought, we'll be pulling them down in 50 years' time. I said, 50 years' time? I said, you're going to break up the community again because you can't build right houses. I said, see just across the street for their houses in Galsby Street. They've got an old school, my old school, 250 years old. Built it right around about the time Robbie Burns was born. I said, and it's just had a paint job. And it looks brand new, and yet today with high technology and all the ins and outs, they're building crap houses. No, no, here, because I, I, I was out on my own most of the time, and I learned to observe people. And the women up that close were the greatest, because with the front of the close upwards was all spotless. And there was three houses using the one toilet, and the toilet was always clean. And if one of the women put out a washing and then went down to the street, down the street to get messages, and it started raining, one of the other women went out automatically and took all the washing in. And, uh, my <coughs> mother, she was out working, and my grandmother looked after us to bring a wage into the house. Because during the war, my father, he was in the army. And there was very little coming in. So the mother had to go out and work, and my grandmother was doing the, the babysitting. Whereabouts was your mother working, and what did she do? My mother worked in Artisan, in the tailoring. They were making clothes, and uh, in at night, <coughs> excuse me, in at night, uh, it was a Wednesday, I always remember a Wednesday night, it was steamy night. She went to the steamer to do the washing. And he we came back and he that was that in the, the house, you know. The, my grandmother she, she had the dinner ready for us coming out of school. Make sure we went back to school and at night again he, for tea time. The mother was finished work, came in, and it was a shame, you know, going to the steamy to do do the washing. And he put it round the back. Get it dried, ironed, and uh, the weekend we were doing the shopping. My grandmother and sometimes went out and done the, the shopping for my mum, and also my aunt. And went to the steamy, and as Jim said, uh, we done a wee bit deal with the mothers when they come along. They helped them up the six steps into the steamy, and we got a penny, and. <laughs> it was whoever was there first got the, got the job of lifting them up and getting the penny. If you came later on, or you didn't get it. And we played, played pitch and toss up next to the therma tank. And that was a bit of a gamble then. That was illegal at the time. And the polis used to spring on us and we'd run away and they would say, Don't run, I know your father. We said, Oof. And because we knew them, we thought the Poli the Polis knew us. We said, oh. And Jack, tell us memories of significant women in your life. Maybe start with your, well, your mother. I must start with my mother. I must start with my mother. Because my father didn't work. He had rheumatic fever. So my mother had to work. And she worked in the school. But I never knew what she'd done in the school. I was 14 years of age and I went around to see her in the school and she was scrubbing the floor. So I, I tried to pick her up. She says, that's my job. So that was my first experience seeing a woman work. And I left school when I was 15. And I went into, uh, my second factory I went into was Riggins and Castell Street. And they made coats. And the majority of employees there were women. 
and they had they were all working at machines. They must have been a hundred machines. They were all stitched up with coats. And they had a, a foreman who was a man. And he walked up and down the line to make sure they weren't speaking or lifting their heads. I couldn't believe it. So I complained to my I complained to my own foreman and he says nothing to do with me, it wasn't in their section. So eventually I fell out with the boss and they sacked me. So the next job I experienced with women was the Springfield Steelworks. That was the corner of Springfield Road and London Road. And I was probably about 18, 18, 80 years of age at that time. And the crane, it was a steelwork, and the crane went from inside the factory out to the yard. And the cranes that were in the yard, they were, they were employed by the females. So I couldn't believe it, that the men were inside the factory at the heaters, and the women were working outside. Because I had experience with my mother and how she was treated. So what I'd done was, I raised it with the shop shears at that particular time, and uh, a couple of weeks later I was sacked. So that was my... And when was that you started working in there? I would think around 90, early 1950s. And if you can imagine, the 1950s, we had never heard of feminism. We had never heard of any woman fighting for anything. We had never heard of equality. We didn't know that we, that uh, we were, um, the, the idea was that women, they were out there for pin money, that uh, you were going to get married and somebody's going to look after you. So well, wait a minute, I have no intention of getting married. How could you bring that into it? Or, as one last I said, tried that, it didn't work. He ended in the hospital, dead scared, and he never came back. <laughs> that was true. And uh, so, I, I was all sorts of, we were broadening our horizons. He even went to Ireland. Went to Ireland. Have you ever heard of the Behans? Uh, ever heard of them? What, madam? The Behans. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, they, they lived in this house in the state, you see, a beautiful house in the state. But you could tell their house because they never dug the garden, they never did anything. All they did was sit and talk politics. <laughs> the mother and the, the whole lot of them never did any cleaning. I says, you think because I washed my face some bourgeoisie or something? <laughs> up in the upper class? You could do an idea. And it was absolutely fascinating. Dominic took us through on the bus, top of the bus in Dublin, took us all through. He knew every place in that city. 